What kind of birthday present do you get the man who has everything? What? I know what we can get him for his birthday. 500 bucks? Dude, are you serious? Do I look like a dude? No cash. Donuts. There's donuts in the machine? It's not my first time doing this for some old guy's a birthday present. You got an ATM machine? <laughs> Super Sex, starring Kevin Nealon. Let's some chopsticks. Elizabeth Perkins. No. Yes. No. Ruby Modine. <laughs> Efren Ramirez. Over there. And Ed Asner. Ready? Super Sex is a new short film written for the screen and directed by Matthew Modine. Super Sex, come and get some. <laughs> <laughs> guys thank you congratulations on on the movie and uh the trebecca film festival screenings i've heard that they are sold out that is fantastic all sold out <laughs> thank uh, you very much so i want to know what the what the genesis of this of this short film was was it something that you sort of came up with as a, as, as a venue to work with, with with your daughter or was it something that the two of you came up with together no, the New York Times building does these great things called the New York Times Talks. And uh, they were doing a talk with Eli Wallach, the wonderful, wonderful, amazing Eli Wallach. And afterward, he asked me to come back in the green room. And, and as I was leaving, he said, I got a joke for you. And he told me the joke, super sex. And <clears throat> it kind of haunted me. I thought it was something was kind of special about the joke and that it could be an interesting short film. And, you know, obviously it needed to be opened up and expanded. And once I finished the screenplay, the first person I asked to read it was, was Ruby. And uh, she said, it's really terrific. I want to play the prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> what was your first thought on, on that? Well, uh, yeah, I thought it kind of be weird to direct your daughter in a movie where she's playing a prostitute. But... It's okay, you know. It's she's a light, I mean, it's a light-hearted affair in terms of uh, prostitution. Yeah. It's not like absolutely, a, yeah. It's not like a hardcore documentary on the. That's <laughs> on right. The Ruby did stuff. some research and she found that that uh, um, more actresses have been nominated for playing prostitutes than any other type of role, and you know, goes all the way back to Helen Hayes, uh, Jodie Foster, Jane Fonda, Mira Sorvino. I mean, it's a, the list is quite long, so. I thought, well, that's not a bad thing. You may, you're not going to get nominated for an Academy Award for a short film, but it's a good place to start. How did you feel? What made you want to play the, the prostitute? It's a great role. Yeah, I just, I really, really liked the, uh, the script, and I thought it was hilarious. And each person that I read down, I, I pictured their face. So I told him, I, want, I really want to play the prostitute, and I think that you should get Kevin Nealon and Elizabeth Perkins to play the brother and sister. So, I don't know. I was really, really excited about it. I thought it was a great script. Why, why Kevin and Elizabeth? Uh, I mean, outside of the fact that they're extremely talented, the both of them, what was it about them that you sort of saw in those characters? I spent time with them on uh, the set of Weeds. And on and off camera, they are the most incredible and amazing duo in life and on camera. And I don't know, the, the scene with the donut, you know, eat the donut really slow. The reaction, I just was telling my dad, I was like, he would ad lib everything so well. Like, oh, I don't know. He's, yeah, they're terrific people. Well, oh, go ahead, Matthew. No, I was gonna say they haven't seen the film, so they don't know what the donut, what the hell oh, you're talking about. I apologize. About. <laughs> <laughs> when you're working uh, with actors like Kevin and Elizabeth, who are uh, so good together and already have a very clear working rapport and know how to play off of each other a little bit, do you let them ad lib? Or are you are you sticking pretty sti stri uh, pretty close to the script? No, I mean, all the directors that I've worked with, from Stanley Kubrick to Oliver Stone to Robert Altman, they all say the most important thing about. Uh, directing a film is casting. You know, you have to cast uh, people that understand the roles and, and people that you believe are talented. And uh, from Efren Ramirez to Ruby to Kevin to Elizabeth to Edward Asner, who plays the father, um, I just really have to, you just have to kind of stay out of their way. You, you know, there's a script, so there's a structure, and then you work within that structure. So any kind of improvisation comes out of what the script is. So you're not, you're not just pulling things out of, out of thin air. Um, so the improvisation that they do is based on the script. And 
you 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 always want to create an environment for people to be able to cre to 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 create. Um, this gentleman standing here, right here next to me, come up here for a second, Eddie. This <laughs> this man is the uh, the he was the music supervisor. Have a seat. He's the music supervisor of my film. And give him a hand. Give him a round of applause, guys. <laughs> so so. It, you know, once the film was completed, then we have to find a way to find a musical score for the film. And music in film is another character in a film. You know, it's a, it's a very important character because he's, uh, he's uh, commenting on things that are being said and encouraging the audience to understand whether something is, is silly, funny, uh, touching, you know, all those things that music do. It would be wonderful in our lives, and we kind of do it with, with iPhones and iPods of having uh, speakers in our ears and walking down the street, and we're all kind of listening to our own life soundtrack, right? So when you make a movie, you've got to find someone who can, who can bring that to the film, and this, this gentleman is just a musical genius. I'm sorry, you want to say something, Eddie? I'm uh, proud and happy to be a part of this film. <laughs> And uh, it's a lot of fun creating, a lot of fun musically commenting on what happened. And uh, I, think it, I think everyone who sees it will enjoy it. I, I'll add that the music does really set the tone for this film in a wonderful way. I mean, as you said, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a movie about, uh, in many ways, about this conversation with this prostitute. And I think people need to be alerted as to the tone of that and whether or not they can laugh at that and what kind of laughter that is going to elicit. And the music perfectly sets, sets the tone, I would say. Kind of almost like Curb Your Enthusiasm music sets the tone for Curb Your Enthusiasm. It felt a little like that. I, I concur. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Eddie, Eddie and Ruby have worked together, collaborated on, on a lot of different music videos and stuff. I'm good. I can see here on the box. Thanks, brother. All right, there you go. All right. All right. Um, it's become a party. <laughs> I didn't want him to get. I didn't want him to get his own damn seat. He was. <laughs> I didn't feel right having all, my own seat. He was seat. supposed to come up and it's say hello. He and was they, two minutes ready. He was two minutes about to kick him off like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, this this man works with Beyonce. He works with Stevie Wonder. This is this is this is an incredible musician that you we we have joining us today. So I mean. Um, but he's, he's worked with Ruby, because Ruby's not just an actress, she's a singer. Um, she grew up in New York City. We went to school down here at the Greenwich Street Music School. She took piano lessons here. So she was a musician before she was an actor, and now she's an actor who also does music. But, but they've done uh, a whole bunch of music together. And if, if you get a chance to see the film, the, the credit song is an old song from, from the turn of the last century, 1908. Uh, called Love Me Like I Like to Be Loved. And, and uh, that's sort of the, where we got inspiration for the, for the soundtrack of the, of the film. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> I think he Thank was you, asking Matthew you to Martin. affirm that. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, um, yeah, I just wanted the, the, uh, the original song, Love Me Like I, I Like to Be Loved, it does embody the personality of the film. It embodies the the twisted sense of uh, the way you can look at things, the uh, play on words, something that can be uh, meaningful, but yet, and you could twist the meaning. The uh, song embodies that, I think, and uh, the melody of it, I, I love it, and uh, I had a great time creating it, and um, Ruby is a fantastic vocalist, very complete vocalist, and uh, full of versatility. She could do a lot of things, and, um, it's, it's, it's just fun. Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> Ruby, is this embarrassing for you right now? No, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> I'm, I, was, I was lost in everybody talking. I was like, this is lovely. <laughs> do you prefer singing to acting? When did you transition from one to the other? When did you realize that you wanted to do the other as well? Um, well, I love to act. There's two, there's completely different arts. You know, you're, you're doing completely different things in each, in each category. But... Um, I've always known that I wanted to act, and at Rudolf Steiner, they kind of give you both of that. They want, to be, they want you on stage, they want you in singing and acting. But when I went to Marymount, I decided, all right, I, w I need to start working. And It's kind of in my downtime when I'm not working in film, those little lulls that actors have that kind of drive them cr a little crazy because they're like, why am I not working? That I decided to go into the studio with, with Eddie Brown. And I have a lot of original music that 
that I have released, and it's just you, kind of you, there, goes the hand music in hand. videos are online. You can find them. <laughs> Red Sunset is a beautiful song. It's a love song about a broken heart. Uh, she covers the Rolling Stones as tears go by. A song that Paul Newman made famous called Plastic Jesus. Um, she did Smile. Uh, original song, uh, 1905, is a beautiful song. Uh, the music video by Matt Mahurin, amazing. One of the, one of the first uh, people who really made MTV what it is, yeah. 1905. It's a beautiful song. It's a really trippy music video. If, if you really like dark, twisted, odd, like kind of what did I just watch music videos, Yeah. I suggest you check it out. <laughs> this is really sweet. Matthew, you are an extremely proud father at this point. I think that's one of, maybe one of the reasons why you set out to make this short film. Um, I am a very proud father. My son had a film in the festival last year called Mary Xmas that he directed with Dick Van Dyke and uh, Valerie Harper and Glenn Headley. Um, I'm very, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm wary to say anything because I don't want to jinx things, but everything's going along pretty well. My, you know, my kids aren't in rehab. And <laughs> You know, they're, they're doing well with their lives. They're ambitious. My son is, is uh, preparing a, uh, a Star Wars fan movie right now. And he, he brought the storyboards and the, uh, the, the stuntmen that he's been working with and the script. You know, the whole presentation to show it to me because he wanted to practice his pitch. And I, I was flabbergasted. I mean, it's, it's better than, than, you know, I've, I've made about 80 movies or something now. And I think this is this is something that I've never seen before. It was quite extraordinary what he's put together. You know these these uh, fan films that, that that people make. Have anybody who's ever seen any of those those things? Oh, we've all seen them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they they make them in a, in a, as an attempt to get the studios to say this is awesome, this is really cool. Let's get that kid and get him to be the person who directs the film. Now you mentioned directors that you've worked with. You said Oliver Stone, Stanley Kubrick, Robert Altman. There's also Christopher Nolan in there as well. Um, when you set out to direct a film, how much do you have in your head for, of things that you learn from them? Um, well, I've learned from all of them. And if you if you have the opportunity to be working with anybody who's a, an extraordinary uh, who has an extraordinary talent at whatever they're doing, whether it's a musician, uh, an actor, a singer. Um, Pay attention because there's there's so much that you can learn. I mean, every day we have the opportunity to learn something. That you know, it's not something we get to a place where we've learned and that's it. I know everything I know. I mean, it, that, that's it. Evolution has stopped. We're no longer evolving. It, it's it's not true. I mean, the world continues to evolve, and and we each and every day when we get out of bed, we have the opportunity to learn something. So all those directors that I've worked with, it was like going to the greatest film school that anybody could ever go to. Working, working with not just the ones that you mentioned, but Alan Parker, who directed Birdie, and Alan J. Pakula, who did Orphans. Um, I mean, it's, it, I don't want to leave anybody out, but, but I paid attention while I was on all those sets and, and learned, learned something from each of them. You referenced their extraordinary talent. I'm curious if when you were on those sets, um, you could tell those talents right away, because oftentimes on a film set, a director's talent can be elusive. They might not interact with the actors in a way that feels comforting, but when the final product comes out, you're like, holy shit, that person knew exactly what they were doing. <laughs> Did you ever have an instant uh, where you were working with you know, an acclaimed, renowned director, but we're kind of like, I don't know what we're doing here, and I hope this turns out. No one, no names yeah. or anything. Yeah, yeah, Even yeah. Stanley Kubrick, people who worked with him were kind of like, oh, well, I'm here for two years. Well, yeah. I, ho I hope something comes out. And it always did, yeah. but... Well, you, with someone like Stanley Kubrick, you know that you're in good hands because he's got such a reputation of making amazing movies, so you, you, you leap. I, I've, I've, I've uh, compared acting to... Uh, has everybody seen the Acapulco divers that you go to? Have you ever seen the photographs? They, they go to... So what happens in Acapulco is they, they get up on the top of this incredibly high cliff. I think it's more than 100 feet, right? And they have to time their dive. So a, a wave comes in, it hits the rocks, and as that wave starts to go out and the next one's coming in, there's a, there's a swell. There's, a, there's a, a, a good swell of water. And that's the moment that they have to hit the water. So you're not just diving off the, off the cliff and doing something beautiful and graceful but you're having to time that beautiful grace and be able to hit cold, deep, dark water. Otherwise, you hit your head on the rocks and you're dead. So, so every time you, you act in a movie, it's, it's kind of like that. You get this script, 
that's standing there up on the top of the cliff and the director and the other actors and everything, and you, you want to do the best that you can and you dive off of this cliff hoping that you're going to reach that deep, dark, cold water and not your hit, hit your head on the rocks. And over the course of my career, which is more than 35 years now and a lot of movies, I've hit my head on the rocks a few times, but I'm all right. I'm, <laughs> You've done 80, uh, upwards of 80 dives, you said? How, yeah, what, yeah. what percentage of uh, head hits do you think is in that 80? There's half the movies I've made with I'm really proud of. I'm, yeah. very, I'm very happy with. Um, there's, there's several of them that uh, were extraordinary experiences and I think quite unique, unusual films. And then there's some, you know, there's some turkeys in there that, that you wish that you hadn't done and, and been involved with. But I think those are pretty good odds. You know that uh, Babe Ruth, that if you, if you strike out seven out of ten times, you are one of the greatest baseball players in the history of baseball. Seven out of ten times, you're batting 300. You know? If you make Full Metal Jacket, you're allowed to strike out for the rest of your career if you oh. want to. But you, you know, fortunately, that didn't happen to you. Um, I have a question for you. you know, I, I listened to an interview with you one time where you talked about how, as a young actor, you had really sort of thought about how to become a famous actor. And you looked at all the other actors around you who were becoming really famous and saw that what sort of kept them or got them famous was sort of playing a version of War Machines, almost. Like, they were sort of playing alpha male Killing Machine, Schwarzenegger, Cruz, and Top Gun at the time. And uh, you're at this point where you have uh, a son who's making movies, you have a daughter who's acting. How have you sort of brought, have you, do you feel like you have to protect them from certain ideas of the industry as well so that they can go into the industry creatively fulfilled and with integrity the same way that, that you had a, at a certain time? No. No, that's, you know, that kind of journey is Ruby's journey. It's, it's Eddie's journey. It's my son's journey that, that, uh, you, what you try to do as a, as a, as a parent, as a, as a mentor, I think mentoring is very important. I love giving uh, young film students or young acting students the opportunity to come to my sets and work and observe um, so that they can learn. But the journey that you take in life is yours. You know, they, they often talk about this, that, that, that each of us are unique. You know, we hear that our lives, right? That there's no, not another person like you. There's not another person like you. Well, it's true. And that little genius that, that is you, let's say it's the size of this button that's on my shirt. And if you, are there any actors in, the, in this group? Are there any filmmakers in this group? Are there any directors in this group? Um, okay, what do you do? What do you do in the yellow shirt? You don't have, <laughs> okay, it's none of my business. <laughs> okay, all right, it's cool, don't get angry. <laughs> um, well, that, that, it's true, that, but that little genius that, that is you, that little voice that is you, if you're a creative person, there's all kinds of people that want to stomp that voice out of you. There's all kinds of people that want to kill it and say, you want to be an actor? Who the hell do you think you are? You want to be a director? Who do you think you are? You want to be a musician? Oh, come on, man. And they, they're people that just mean and they want to crush it. They want to crush that little voice that is you. And we live in such a world that is so noisy. It's, you know, the noise that's out on the street, the cars, the taxis, the things we put in our ears, the, the announcements that come over, the, the subway announcements, the, just the noise. We live in such a noisy world that that little voice, that little voice that is yours, is so easy to, to crush. It's so easy to kill it. And, and you just have to create an environment where you can be and, and hear that little voice that is yours, because it's special, and you, and you do have a unique voice, and that's, that's your creative creativity, and you shouldn't let anybody tell you that you can't do and can't be what you want to be. Ruby, did you ever look to, uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, did you ever look to sort of your, your father's voice over the course of his career, and sort of look back at his career as a sort of means of inspiration for where you could go as an actress, or was it always about sort of fostering your own path? No, uh, I've grown up with him, so I've seen his movies my entire life, and it was always inspiring to me. Do you have a favorite one? No, I can't say that I do. There's, there's a little piece in each, probably like a, a couple that I go, oh, that was a good scene, like the blackout. That was a, there's a couple good scenes in there. That movie's twisted, but anyway, but yeah, so there's a couple scenes in each film that I like, but I don't have a specific favorite. But um, yeah, when I reached a certain uh, when I reached a certain age and I figured out what I wanted, there's a lot of people trying to create a distance between us at this point because I'm doing a lot of different films and he's working on a, little, a lot of different films. But I'm I'm happy about how I've grown up and we've always remained close and we've done little projects here and there together and 
Now we have super sex, so look at that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I want to turn over to the audience for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Hey, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Um, not only do I love seeing family being so supportive of one another, but I think it's also important that an entire team is recognized. So I have a lot of respect for everything that's going up on stage. Um, my question about the film is what inspired Ruby's outfit, especially with the um, huh. pink wig and the Superman symbol. I don't know about you, it's Monday. I feel like going to a rave right now. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of what inspired that pink wig. I, I mean, a lot of people have said what it looks like, Natalie Portman and, yeah. I wanted you to wear that wig. Oh, yeah, and you know what's crazy is he had an idea of, like, let's do green or orange or what about blonde, and uh, it was... Danielle King said it's got to be hot pink. She's got to wear a hot pink wig. The, co the costume designer on the film. Yeah, and, and the costume just came because it's super sex, you know? It would kind of be weird if I was wearing a Catwoman outfit, right? And I was like, I'm, yeah. The joke wouldn't really work. <laughs> I have to call it you, Catwoman sex. Yeah, <laughs> which would just be so odd and so... <laughs> that would be weird. Then somebody would say, well, cat like pussy, and oh, you know, then, then it would take on a whole nother flavor, you know? It should be part of a franchise kind of thing, yeah. you know? We could move into uh, different characters in their own standalone films. Next question. Yeah. You know what I mean, like pussycat sex. Yeah. And then, and then you would have been we doing... Got it. Then you would have been doing that Tom Jones song, that pussycat, pussycat, I love you. Yes, Push, I... You're pushing buttons here, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Hey guys, so my question is for Matthew. I just wanted to know, uh, were there any uncomfortable moments on set while working with your daughter on this film? Oh, there were many of them. <laughs> but, but you see this patch on my eye? That's how I got it. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it was, a, it was a real pleasure. You know, I mean, she is my daughter, but if she wasn't my daughter, Ruby would be one of my best friends, if not the best friend. Um, my best friend is my wife, so I don't know how to, it's kind of hard to separate them. But uh, no, it was, it was a pleasure, because when we get on a, f on, on, on a set, whether we're in the recording studio with Eddie, working on music and everything. Um, there's a professionalism you, there's that a, divides yeah, you from family. Yeah, absolutely. Once you get on set, there's no longer that like, hey, Papa, like, let's talk about something. It's completely work-oriented. There's nothing... There's no favoritism. If I do something wrong, he's going to say, like, come here. What are you, what are you doing? Like, and then I punch him in the eye when he gets too feisty. <laughs> There's nothing like the sort of scheduling deadlines of a film set to limit any kind of anything other than professionalism, right? Well, yeah, and, I, you know, if I thought it was going to be awkward in any way, I mean, this isn't the first film that I've done, you know. I'm, there's, well, that's a different topic. But, you know, if I didn't, if I thought it was going to be horrifically terrifying to be on set looking at Ed Asner being like I'm gonna give you super sex I wouldn't have said I want to be the hooker yeah so it's just a professionalism and family how did you get Ed Asner in the film uh, I, I met as Ed in a poker game we were playing poker there's a there's a guy named Norby Walters uh, so NWA Norby Walters and Associates that's where NWA got the name of their band they were they were there and, and, and Norby said what's the name of your band and they looked up and they saw his name and they took the initials and said NWA um, he's a, he's a real character that's Norby wild, right? he has a Wait, his, that's a true story that's, that's a true, true story. that's what I'm yeah. like. <laughs> he has he has I thought a, you were totally no it's true around. it's true he has a catchphrase uh, never too big never too big remember Modine never too big and, and he has this poker game, and everybody that comes to the game, he says the same thing to all of them. You're never too big to come and play poker at my house. And, and uh, Ed Asner was one of the people who was there, and we're looking to cast this role. And um, so I told him about it. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know, this, I know the joke. I know the joke. I heard it before. I got one question. Are you playing the prostitute? And I said, no, I'm not playing the prostitute. Why would I play the prostitute? And he said, because it'll make it easy for me to say no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of you guys may have seen the, the, have seen the movie Up. Yeah? Ed Asner is, is the cartoon character of the, the old guy and the voice of that, that guy. But he's, he's not he's, that sweet little man in Up. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's, 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 he's got more <laughs> Emmy nominations than I think anybody, more Emmy nominations and wins. I think maybe him and Mary Tyler Moore because he was on the Mary Tyler Moore show and Lou Grant for so many years, but he's, uh, he's quite a character. We have time for a couple more questions. Next question. 
Hey guys, um, quick question. What was it like picking the right songs for the film? I'm gonna let Picking Eddie the right songs? Right? For the film, yeah. Picking the right song. When he, um, for writing the songs yeah. for the film? Yeah. Well, the, picking the right song was finding a song that we didn't have to pay for because yeah. mu music, music rights are very expensive. So we found this song that's in the, in the uh, public domain and uh, it's in the Library of Congress, uh, Love Me Like I Like to Be Loved. Fantastic song, and then Eddie, and I'll let Eddie tell you how how he took took that and riffed on it, and and. It's yeah. the same song throughout the whole movie. Yeah. It, was, it was a uh, collaborative effort um, in terms of uh, determining how we were going to use it, uh, what elements of the personality of the song we were going to extract, and make it a part of the movie. That was a collaborative effort. Um, yeah. That's I think that's Eddie, Eddie does all the songs in the movie. And I told him, I, I, I love the Mills Brothers. And I, you know, the Mills Brothers would do these songs where they would play all the instruments with their mouth. You know, they'd play a horn, they'd play a saxophone, they'd play bass, bass. And so Eddie, there's a song in the film inside the donut shop. And Eddie does all the voices, like McFarland. What's that guy's name? The Seth McFarland? No, no, no. Uh, the, the singer. What was his name? McFar Mc Bobby McFerrin? Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin. Yeah. Eddie does a Bobby McFerrin and does a whole whole song with just eight his tracks of it. Yeah. About eight tracks of me doing a trumpet, trombone, and I'm doing it all with my voice. That was fun. That was fun. fun. It's my favorite song in the film. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question from the audience right Hello. here. My question actually is for you, Eddie. I wanted to know how is it like working with the Queen Beyonce? How do you create this music for her? And you know, I feel like she has a very demanding personality. Even though she's nice, but like with her music, she can be demanding. So how do you find the perfect song for her? And also, do you have any memorable moments with any of the artists you worked oh, with? Oh man, um, where I begin working with her, I I can't remember it ever not being fun. It's very intense, but I mean, I'm intense. I'm serious. I'm about my business. I mean, everybody I surround myself with, they're, they're, perfect, they're perfectionists. So I don't feel out of my element working with those type of people. I'm working with another person who is kind of like me. Um, uh, a couple years back, I was uh, fortunate to play the, um, the Grammy salute that she did for Stevie Wonder. And uh, rehearsals, though they, they were very intense, but uh, it, it's very nice working with people who pay um, the same amount of attention to detail as you do. It's it's hard to be that guy who is you know is picky when I'm surrounded with people who are picky like me and and pay attention to detail. It's like oh man, I'm in my so element. And that's what's fun. the line? If you're the smartest person in the room, leave that room, right? Like that's kind of you don't want to. I like being the smartest person in the room. I don't like it. Yeah. I don't like it. I, I like to be able to, if, if every time I wake up is an opportunity to learn, I want the environments that I work with, uh, the environments that I work in to be an extension of that, of that way of living. Always be challenging yourself. Guys, uh, Super Sex is so funny. It was such an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here. The film is at the Tribeca Film Festival right now. Sold out, but maybe you can find a, a way in. And then will it be uh, they showing always, They else? always have rush tickets. Right. You know, they, they always keep like 40 or 50 rush tickets. So if you show up, you can, you can usually, you know, get, get a seat. Following the festival, is, are there any plans to put it online or anything for people to see it? Yeah, it'll, it'll have a festival life. And then, uh, like my son's other film, uh, Merry Xmas, it'll be on iTunes. So you can, you can rent it or, or buy it for $1.99, or rent it for 99 cents on, on iTunes. Um, there's really not a big f financial, uh, you know, you don't make money <laughs> from making short films. You, you have to divide it three ways. The I AOL gets a third, the aggregator gets a third, and you get a third. So I think the most successful film ever to be on iTunes, it was short film, made about uh, $10,000, so that means that, that's the most successful one, so that means the filmmaker made 3,300, right, 3,300, and you and do. Who knows how much the filmmaker spent on, on that short exactly. film. Exactly, so you make these movies because you love them, you, you, you make them because uh, it's gonna be some kind of, uh, because you wanna work with people again in the future, and, 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 and uh, I had such a great time making this film, working with Ruby, working with Eddie, the entire cast and crew, we had such a good time and, and uh, I hope to uh, 
to 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 be in front of you guys again in the future with a feature film that that we've that we've all worked on, collaborated on, and uh, thank you for coming today. Yeah, I Absolutely. hope you all go out and check out Central Park, the movie that's coming out in oh, fall too. It's a horror she's, movie. She's plugging her other movie. I am. <laughs> you said feature good film. Good on you. <laughs> good good on you, Ruby. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you for being here. <laughs>